Hey everybody, Brandon here, and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be covering game three of Fisher's My 60 Memorable Games. This time, Fisher is playing with the Black Pieces and is playing against Petrosian in 1958. Uh, and there was an interesting uh, note right before the game started, uh, which talks about how Petrosian and Fisher are as players. Petrosian is uh, someone that takes less risks, that's that's very solid. Uh, and then Fisher, of course, uh, aims for complications as long as he thinks they're correct. So, um, anyways, let's jump into the game. Uh, this one I actually had trouble with uh, when I was doing Guess the Move. That's how, kind of how I go over a, a lot of Master games now, which is uh, I take out a board, and then I guess which moves are being uh, played because then it forces me to calculate instead of just like, you know, it's easy to go through and be like, oh, this move makes sense. Oh, that move makes sense. Sure, we can find understanding and meaning behind a move after we see it. But sometimes we need to practice working on before we know what the move is, what do we think they played or should play? Let's get through it. Uh, Petrosian open with c4. We see knight to f6, knight to c3, g6, g3, bishop to g7, bishop to g2, castles, knight to f3, d6, castles, and now knight to c6 here. Um, and the whole point of knight c6 is if d4 happens, we can play e5, some sort of knight e7. This is a very standard type of development uh, in these king's Indian positions. Uh, Petrosian does not actually play d4, he plays d3. Now, after this, uh, Fisher played knight h5, which is actually kind of a surprise to me. I'm more used to seeing uh, moves that, you know, would focus on development uh, if the center isn't defined. So I was kind of expecting the move uh, e5 instead. But knight h5 was played. And uh, now... Petrosian plays d4, with the argument that they can kind of waste time here because the knight is kind of offside there. Um, there was another game uh, that Fisher mentioned uh, that in this position went rook b1, and uh, he was expecting Petrosian not to follow this line. This was played two years prior, uh, where f5, queen c2, a5 a3, and then this move f4 uh, was played, and this was uh, Petrosian Vasyukov, and uh, apparently Petrosian um, had a pretty bad game uh, and lost that one pretty badly. So he didn't repeat that line of, uh, of rook b1, instead went for d4, and after d4 now we see e5, which is uh, a typical move here. Now, um, d5 is the standard move. We should always, always look at uh, what happens if White decides to capture instead. Uh, Fisher gives this interesting line here. D takes e5, uh, queen takes d8, rook takes d8, knight to d5. Rook to d7, you have to defend c7 here. That's a big problem. Bishop to h3, f5, uh, g4. And there's this really incredible move here, uh, knight f6, which is quite surprising. But there is a very important idea behind it. First off, if knight takes f6, bishop takes f6, there's this nice trap, takes takes, and bishop takes, there's rook g7 check, winning the bishop. And also, instead here, um, if g takes f5, now there's knight takes d5, or after c takes d and uh, rook takes d, they can't really take uh, on g6 without losing their bishop, so uh, black is quite happy here as well. I thought this was really fascinating. Um, going back all the way. Bam, 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 bam. Bam. Uh, D5 was played, which is something I'd be a lot more comfortable seeing uh, as I used to play the King's Indian regularly. We see knight to e7. E4. Uh, and the whole point is, again, to gain control over the e4 square by putting a pawn there. Uh, and trying to prevent f5, as, of course, if black gets f5, they get more control over e4. So e4 is kind of designed to make f5 less desirable. But, of course, going f5 anyways is the best way to go. <coughs> uh, 
Um, I also thought the there was an interesting move, C5. Uh, I didn't guess that move in my game, but it was definitely of interest to me. Uh, normally, the idea here is C takes uh, and then B takes, where you play the, some, the sort of uh, C5 and then uh, Knight C6 to D4 and plug the D4 square and uh, just don't really care that you have a weakness on, on D5 because you get D4. Uh, it turns out this isn't so great though. Um, rook to e1 is is playable. We're after rook to e8. Uh, this move c5 is very annoying, which creates a lot of weaknesses uh, in Black's position. Um, even though it's a kind of I would like to say temporary sacrifice. Like if you take on c5, it's it's at most temporary just because the c pawns are extremely weak. Um, and if you play uh, more critically with d5, e takes, knight takes. Um, there was a lot of moves here that gave white an advantage. I, I like knight e4 the most. And the whole point of knight e4 is, is f5 is not really playable because of knight d6. And uh, bishop f8 is is like the, the top move, which is kind of sad to play. Uh, and then you can play moves like, like b4 here and just try to exploit the fact that um, white White's pieces, even though black has some activity with the knight on d5 and then on h5, it just feels like uh, black's the one having, or sorry, white's the one having the fun here. So um, going back here after uh, e4, uh, yeah, f5 just feels like the most natural move. c5 just doesn't really make sense uh, in this position. e takes f5 and g takes f5. Uh, of course, bishop takes f5 is interesting. And it's something that I wanted because of what happened in the game. Um, I didn't bother to look further, even though I probably should have for what happened. But uh, I was considering bishop takes f5 for what we'll see. Instead, g takes f5 was played and allows knight takes e5. Uh, and originally, I wasn't sure how to feel about this uh, because after knight takes g3, which is, is the um, move here, uh, h takes g3 was played. And then bishop takes e5. Uh, I was actually thinking of, of playing this here, but I was worried of some c5 uh, in this position, and that's why I didn't really want to go for it, uh, as as uh, this really didn't look tempting. That's why I wanted to play bishop takes instead, even though you always want to take with the pawn. Um, turns out this is actually perfectly fine after c5. Uh, c5 is definitely not the, the right way to go here, as... Uh, f4 is playable and the more you look at this position the harder it is to find a reasonable move for for white here um top move is something like a4 and if, if you play something innocuous like a3 and it looks like there's no difference somehow there's a huge one after knight f5 black is significantly better um or even just clearly better and there's ideas of like knight h6 bishop g4 uh, eventually maybe even taking on, on g3, and uh, despite white's nice center, it feels like black's getting a lot of activity here, and that's very obnoxious to deal with. So uh, instead, uh, bishop takes e5 was played, which feels a lot more natural, and um, that's kind of what I was expecting in the game. But instead, uh, like there, there's kind of an issue with this after the move f4. Uh, and that's why d takes was better because if if we try something like d takes and f4 here, um, first off you can always consider a move like uh, e4, but it's actually not even necessary here. You can play uh, e takes f4 followed by a move like knight g6, and black is totally fine. Um, let's just say bishop takes and, and knight g6. Uh, we could try taking um, on f4 at some point. Our bishop is pretty good. Um, even though our king isn't really the safest and our center is definitely um, not better than, than white's, our development in the future shouldn't be that uh, impossibly hard, besides maybe the bishop here. Um, but this this felt a little bit better than what happened in the game. Um, after bishop takes e5, f4, and bishop g7, uh, the big difference here is that instead of bringing the bishop to f4 and then playing some sort of knight g6, 
uh, they have a better plan here, which is bishop e3 to d4, which is extremely obnoxious to deal with because when they bring the bishop to d4, they're trading off our worst piece or our best piece for not their worst piece. This is definitely still a relatively good piece, especially because of its task of getting to d4. Um, but this is not a desirable trade for black whatsoever. So bishop e3, uh, bishop d7. Now, uh, bishop to d4 here. Uh, and yeah, this causes problems. Um, just because, again, when this when these pieces come off, that's not, not fun to deal with. So knight g6 was played. Um, and after rook to e1, Fisher made a mistake with rook to f7. Um, and yeah, I wasn't sure what rook f7 exactly was doing. I wanted to actually take on uh, d4 here. Now, admittedly, I had the idea of queen f6, uh, trying to trade off because it does feel like we have a space disadvantage. But there's actually a much stronger move here in h5. Uh, h5, h4 is coming, trading off uh, some kingside pawns, and actually it's very unclear what's going on here. Uh, and it looks like black is totally fine uh, and kind of escaped all the problems that were happening there. Uh, but instead, rook f7 was played. And Petrosian doesn't allow this again uh, with playing bishop to f3. Now, if we try the same variation, uh, queen takes d4, h5 is unplayable because there's a there's a bishop on f3. So uh, now queen to f8 was played with the idea of potentially taking on d4, playing queen g7 uh, to trade off the um, the bishops there. And then also raises the argument, uh, how is my line any different? Uh, if if you want to play queen g7, why can't you just play queen f6 here? Uh, but there are some problems after takes takes. Uh, there's some knight b5. And after uh, knight ta uh, bishop takes b5, otherwise it's kind of hard to defend c7 and a7. Uh, you're left with this backward pawn on... Uh, c7, that's very annoying to deal with. Uh, it looks like maybe there's uh, defensive chances. Let's just say um, knight f8's played here. Uh, rook c1 and then rook f7. Our, our biggest goal would be to play a piece to c5, or knight to c5. Um, unfortunately, it just doesn't matter because after, let's say, rook c3, uh, rook c8, first off, they could try poking us with a move like rook a3, but the second knight d7 comes, they can play b4, which prevents knight c5. Um, but that's a bit deeper, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, getting back to the game, though, rook f7, uh, bishop f3, queen f8. King f2. Now we see rook e8 uh, trying to trade off um, the rooks here. Rook takes, queen takes, and uh, bishop takes g7. I thought it'd be interesting to point out this uh, this move, but I think b6 causes causes some problems here with some sort of queen a8. At least for the moment, the bishop is just out of the game, so even if they're somehow able to save it, um, this, this is just not a smart move to make. Not really a pawn uh, that makes sense to go for. Bishop takes g7 makes a lot more sense uh, and is a lot more critical. Rook takes g7, queen to d4 now. Um, and b6 to defend the a7 pawn because the a7 pawn now it makes sense to go for it like if rook e7 um, move like queen takes a7 queen takes b7 is actually pretty problematic and there's there's not really any play on the e-file to speak of so b6 rook to h1 a5 knight to d1 now uh, remaneuvering to e3 to target the uh, the f5 pawn because the f5 pawn is a weakness in black's position here. Queen to f8, knight to e3, rook to f7, b3, and queen to g7. Um, and I feel like this trade is definitely something that black is happy about. Uh, there is a nice way to kind of get the exchange on black's terms, which is the move knight c2. Uh, that the computer pointed out, where after it takes, and now you can take with the knight. And the knight's just much more active here. And there's still problems with some sort of rook h5 and bishop to d3 um, action, as we'll see in the game. Um, but instead, Petrosian took on g7. King takes g7. Uh, and we see a3 here. 
which kind of forces rook f8. Um, because if you don't play rook f8 and you play move that looks innocuous, like like h6 here, uh, b4 could be pretty problematic, uh, where uh, Petrosian's just going to jump over to the a file, and black's not in time to contest it. Rook f8, and now rook a1 uh, here. So rook f8 is kind of a necessity. Uh, and we'll see this kind of pop out uh, pop up uh, repeatedly in the game where every move pretty much if the rook goes to the seventh rank or the rook's not able to play rook a8 in one move uh, then black's going to be able to take over the file uh, or white will my apologies so if uh, if after bishop b2 rook f7 is played yeah then b4 makes a lot of sense here because even if rook f8 Rook a1 gets the file. Um, so uh, that kind of restricts this rook to the 8th rank here. Fisher plays knight e7. Uh, bishop to d3. And now h6. Rook to h5 was played. This is kind of an interesting uh, poke and parade uh, type, of, type of move. Um, and I looked at bishop e8 when I was analyzing this um, before I looked at any annotations or the engine. Um... But at the same time with bishop e8, the whole point is, of course, to kick the rook and then either go back or play with something like bishop g6. Um, preferably bishop d7, of course. Because it's just more flexible. It's just on a... Uh, it's just... It has more scope there. Um, I was actually worried of some sort of knight takes f5. Where after knight takes f5, rook takes f5. The rook has to move as it was hanging there. Um... I wasn't so sure what's going on here. For some reason, I saw bishop g6 here, but I didn't see it here after rook h8. Or now bishop g6 is going to be winning the exchange. And this is something that black should be extremely happy about because black is now winning. Um, and for some reason, I calculated only king g6. Um, which is actually really funny because I... the. The reason why I knew that, or like I thought that bishop c8 was unplayable is because of this line, knight takes e7, king takes, and bishop e2 is actually checkmate. So if we're enticed to go backwards, um, then of course, white's just up a full piece here, and um, and the game is over. So that would be quite frustrating. Um, however, yeah, you are able to play... Um, bishop e8 because of the aforementioned line here. Rook takes rook h8 followed by bishop g6, uh, which which I I did uh, miss that rook h8 was playable. So uh, rook h2. Now bishop back to d7 here, and this is just allowing a repetition. If rook h5, then bishop e8, uh, and now rook to h1. Uh, and this is kind of a funny move. It's kind of like to provoke some sort of zigzag. Like, for example, rook f6, b4, right? Uh, and this is something Petrosian would be really happy about. Because now uh, white gets the file again. So Fisher goes rook h8, keeping flexibility on the 8th rank here. Knight to c2, now um, moving to d4, which is still attacking the f5 pawn. It's just more active in the center here. King f6 was played. Uh, knight to d4 now, and uh, king to uh, g7 was played, which was interesting. I, I was actually thinking about um, the move h5 with the idea of preventing any future g4 if I go king g6, which will defend uh, all of the pawns here. Um, it is a little tricky, but it turns out this is actually best. Um, king g7 does make a lot of sense, though. So now we see bishop to e2. And uh, now knight g8 was played. I originally wanted rook to f8 um, because I was uh, scared of b4. And, and Fisher also noted that he was quite scared of um, b4 as well. Turns out knight g8 is actually just best anyways. Um, so this is, this is a totally fine move. b4 is played. Now uh, knight to f6. And I'm not sure exactly why I thought... Uh, a takes b4 was better here because after a takes b4, a takes b4, knight to f6. Uh, I'm trying to get back to the eighth rank. Rook to a1 uh, comes and and white is clearly better here. Uh, and there's a lot of issues for for black to solve, um, but instead uh, knight to f6 is just much more accurate. Uh, and after knight to f6, if it takes takes, 
uh, and something like uh, rook to b1 here. Uh, this is a lot less clear after knight e4 check and some move like knight to c5, where now all of a sudden uh, the knight actually has somewhere to go. So the, uh, taking on a5 doesn't really make as much sense. Um, yeah, so knight f6, bishop to d3 here to prevent this knight e4 variation. And now we see a takes b4, a takes b4. Um, and I think this is kind of where Fisher goes wrong. It's king g6. Um, this was not my instinct uh, at all. When I saw this position, I, I guess rook a8. I thought rook a8 was much more interesting. Uh, the whole point is if we get into any variation uh, with like them taking f5, then it, okay, we at least we get the second uh, or third rank and we can always swing around and hit these pawns. And even if we don't win a pawn in return, uh, it feels like there's there's plenty of compensation at the very least. It turns out this is totally correct. Um, but Fisher goes for king g6 instead, giving up the uh, the a file here. We're after rook to a1. Um, knight to g4 check was played. King to e2. Rook e8 check. King to d2. Knight back to f6. Uh, and rook to a6. Which is actually a really sneaky move by Petrosian. Uh, I was looking at the move knight h5 uh, with the idea or hope that knight e2, knight to uh, f6 might uh, offer some sort of repetition here. But there's a really sneaky move with c5. Uh, and this takes advantage of the 6th rank. And uh, black is at the very least losing a pawn, potentially even a piece. For example, takes, takes. Uh, if you take on g3, c takes d6. There's problems with taking on c7, and if you take back, of course, uh, rook takes d6 will win the uh, the bishop on d7. So this is completely losing. Um, so Fisher played rook b8 instead, just waiting on the eighth rank, and then eventually making uh, the move rook c8 after Petrosian's next move, rook a7, and now rook c8. Just because if you play rook c8 immediately and then rook a7. Um, the problem there is that you have to just like find moves to make and it, it's actually quite difficult for black to find useful moves um, that way here. So c5 was played. Um, b takes c5, b takes c5, d takes c5. Knight to f3 and uh, king to f7 was played here. This is pretty important because knight e5 uh, is a bit of a problem. Um, so we need to prevent that. I was actually curious if knight g4 was playable, um, avoiding knight to uh, e5 check potentially. Uh, and yeah, um, you don't really need to even worry about playing knight e5 as white. Instead, just rook, rook to a5, picking up the c pawn. Just completely wins, because after you pick up the c pawn, the c7 pawn is much weaker than the d5 pawn. And uh, black is significantly worse, if not already lost here. So knight to f3, uh, king to f7, knight to e5 check, king e7, knight takes d7, knight takes d7, bishop takes f5. Now we see rook f8, uh, which is kind of a cute move. The idea is that it's kind of trying to provoke bishop takes d7, or after king takes d7, um, it feels like there's significant drawing chances now, which is really nice, uh, because g4 especially isn't playable yet. Uh, if g4, then um, rook takes f4. So this just kind of saves some time. Uh, and after rook f8, uh, g4. And after g4, king to d6 was played. And Fisher said this was losing, but it's not. And it's because of a few different um, intricacies that have to do with the resulting rook ending uh, that are really, really interesting. Um... After bishop takes d7, king takes d7, king to e3, uh, rook to e8 check uh, is, I believe, holding. King d6 also also draws two. I thought this was a bit more interesting because we're just trying to, again, go for the uh, the d pawn and just activate the king immediately. Rook e8 check is fine, though. King f3, king d6, rook a6 check. Um, and there's two moves here. Um, that, that totally worked. King takes d5 actually uh, is drawing. Uh, and there's also a funny move here, uh, c6. And 
yeah, this is a double X clam type of move. This is not obvious at all. I think the obvious move to consider is rook takes c6. And the whole point here is after king takes d5, rook takes h6, uh, now without the c-pawn, we can now play rook to c8 and start pushing our c-pawn forward. And we're actually in time to bring our king back and blockade the, the two pawns here, which is very, very surprising. It feels like uh, this should not work, but it does. Here's a variation to show kind of exactly what would happen. Rook h1, rook c8, rook d1 check. King e6, very important. You have to prevent those two pawns from promoting. Rook e1, king f6, uh, f5, c3. And if king f4, you can uh, go c2. You don't even have to worry about um, g5 check, funnily enough. Uh, rook c1, rook c4, and then king g5. And this um, completely holds the game because, well, we're blockading the pawns and there's not really anything that white can do to make progress here. So that's really surprising. Um, king takes d5, rook takes h7, uh, and now c4. And uh, there was some annotations both by Petrosian and Fisher, um, both of which have their faults. Um, rook h7 was recommended and apparently this wins. Um, turns out it doesn't. So c6 uh, doesn't work uh, and this was given by Fisher. Uh, no, this sorry, this was given by Petrosian but after rook d7 check, king c5, rook d1, uh, c3, like this, this variation here, um, turns out that this actually does end up working out for um, Petrosian because they're just up too many tempos here. C3, uh, F8 equals queen. And if this uh, pawn were on C2 or if King B1 uh, was already played in, and black could play C2 here, it would be a draw. But in this case, it's not. Um, instead, Rook H1 um, was, was played instead after c4, even though rook h7, but yeah, let's go through rook h7 one more time, where c5 was an improvement that was given. And this actually does work. Uh, rook d7 check, king e6, rook to d1. Um, and after rook b8, uh, f5 check was given as a win, but turns out the move does not win. Uh, Fisher only gives the move king e5, but turns out king f6, which looks like a little bit of a strange move, this totally went, uh, totally holds the game. Uh, and the point is, after king f4, we can get away with c3. And it doesn't actually matter uh, that g5 check uh, is able to be played, because after, uh, for example, g6 check here, uh, we can now play, I believe, the move... Uh, king to g8 and then f6 here wait 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 no 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 um sorry uh g5 check king f7 my apologies um was it king f7 no 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 my apologies okay yeah it's king g7 uh the move king g7 here uh even analyzing these with engines uh, beforehand, <laughs> these positions are still extremely difficult to understand. But this move king g7 actually holds, and the point is that um, f6 is a lot less important than g6. We're after f6 check here, um, king g6 now. Uh, there's actually a successful blockade, surprisingly, where after... Um, uh, like after rook c1, for example, um, rook b4 check could just be played. And there's not really a way to successfully avoid it. And if rook d5, which I thought was interesting, I believe uh, rook b5 should actually hold things where now c2 is a problem. So they might have to just bring their king back, uh, which is definitely no fun. So, uh, yeah, a lot of complications in these end games here. Um, but just going back, so uh, the line here, c6, that was given by Petrosian. We'll just look at it a little bit more. Rook d7, king c5. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Actually, we already looked at this. My apologies. Um, let's go on to the main game, because I think that's more important anyways. But that's kind of like a um, passing 
view of of that rook ending which is definitely something that i didn't get at all but i thought was still instructive and interesting to go over that there's still this this really weird blockade from these specific types of moves but rook h1 c3 uh g5 now c5 is played rook d1 check king c4 um so now black is in time to bring their king to b2 here because after king to b2 uh, after king b3 and b2 or or c2 uh king c3 king d2 um black spawns aren't as far advanced so there's uh actually hope here so uh g6 c2 rook c1 king d3 uh this is a necessity to defend the pawn f5 um and it's really tempting to go king d2, but do not do this, uh, because this actually loses a tempo um, to the game, where rook takes c2 is now winning after g7, c4, f6, c3, f7, uh, and let's just say rook c8, and they promote. And of course, uh, now, unfortunately, this is losing uh, in, in this position. So here... Uh, rook g8 is very important because now f6 is not playable because we can take on g6. King f4, king d2, now they take. Uh, king g5, c4, f6, c3, f7. Uh, and this position is a draw. So let's see why as well. Uh, Fisher ended up offering a draw. Turns out he, he said a funny thing here uh, that it was a uh, bad etiquette because he was obviously on the defending side, but um, it was a draw nonetheless. After rook takes g6, king takes g6, uh, the way to draw here is king b1, white promotes, f7, and normally if this was a knight pawn, for example, this would actually be a win, because what black or white, white can do is play queen b4 check, king a2, uh, queen c3, king b1, queen b3, and... Uh, if, if it was like shifted over uh, to the b-file instead, there isn't this possibility. But here, there's actually a drawing move, king a1, which is very hard to see. The whole point of king a1 is you cannot actually take the pawn because it's stalemate. Uh, and of course, king c1 is the type of move that would allow a potential win here with king f5, where now the position repeats, uh, there's more checks, and then if the king ever goes in front, then king e4 again and the king gets closer and eventually wins the pawn. That's why, back here, uh, the move king a1 is so important. Uh, just like a uh, rough overview of how these positions work. If it's queen versus bishop pawn, generally a draw unless the king's close enough. Uh, and if it's a knight pawn, it's pretty much always a win for the queen as long as uh, there's not some weird obstruction or weird study-like uh, position going on there. Anyways, this is going to cover it for uh, game three of Fisher's 60 memorable games. I hope you guys enjoyed this one, and I will let you go and see you in game four. Bye-bye.